morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference today. Before giving the floor to our dearest guest, uh, Mr. Timothy, Professor Timothy Armbrine, uh, I want to introduce our team. Uh, first of all, uh, today, this is my first time being a moderator. Uh, my name is Madonna Ahobadze. I'm from Georgia, Sakartelo. I'm the last year neurosurgery resident in here in Georgia, and I'm also a PhD student in Tbilisi, the capital of the Georgia. Um, a couple of words about our online education meetings. They have started with Professor Hassan Kamil Suju, who is present today. Big thanks uh, to Dr. Hassan Kamil Suju, uh, who is a, a program manager of the neurosurgery department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital in Turkey, and goes on with the contributions of all the residents and as well as with all contributions of all the neurosurgeons who graduated from the same department and also neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents from nearby countries such as mine, Georgia, Sakartvelo, Bulgaria, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, and many others. Uh, now, a couple of words about our protocol. All the mic microphones will be turned off during the presentation of the lecture uh, to avoid any voice or noise pollution. You can ask your question by writing it in the chat section uh, of the Zoom program. And I assure you all your questions will be answered. I will ask them to the lecturer and they will be all discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. And now, if, uh, if there is no question from the audience, I would like to introduce our dearest guest. Uh, it's my biggest privilege to introduce Mr. Uh, Dr. Professor uh, Timothy um, uh, uh, James Armbrine, uh, who is Associate Professor of Radiology at the Duke University Health System in the Department of Radiology. Uh, he has graduated, graduated from the New York Medical College in uh, Valhalla, New York in 2006. In 2006, he became an internal, intern in internal medicine at the New York Medical College St. Vincent's Hospital. In 2007, he became a diagnostic radiology resident at the Duke University Medical Center. Uh, in 2010, he became a, a chief resident at the same center. And in 2011, he uh, was neurology fellow in, at the Duke University Medical Center. In 2012, uh, he became assistant professor of neuroradiology at the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, and um, he got the assistant professor of neurology uh, at the Duke University Medical Center in 2014. Since 2019 on up to today, he's associate professor of neuroradiology at the Duke University of Medical Center. And he's also a director of the spine intervention uh, radiology. Under his name, you would find more than 60 different articles and a couple of dozens of um, chapters in a textbook, as well as significant amount of research and very interesting ongoing research topics as well. And without further ado, uh, Professor Timothy James Amrain, welcome to our uh, online Izmir neurosurgical uh, session. Welcome again, and uh, the stage, virtual stage is yours. You can start the sh screen sharing now. Wonderful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen here, and let me start by uh, thanking you for that kind introduction and thanking everyone for joining today. Uh, and for the opportunity to uh, to join you all and, and kind of present some of the work that we're doing here at Duke and discuss this, I think, very interesting topic. So can everybody see my screen? Are we seeing the title slide? Yeah, we can see. Wonderful. So uh, over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to be reviewing spontaneous intracranial hypotension, which I've subtitled A New Frontier in Medicine. Um, I have real, really no relevant disclosures. If I do talk about the use of fibrin glue, that's an off-label use of that product, as is intrathecal administration of gadolinium for searching for CSF leaks. I do sit on the medical advisory board of the Spinal CSF Leak Foundation here in North America. So what is this diagnosis? Um, uh, for those who haven't heard of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, um, it's actually a bit of a misnomer. Um, it, it is actually caused by a spinal CSF leak. So intracranial is maybe not the best term. Um, in addition, while uh, these leaks are not iatrogenic, which is where the spontaneous term comes from, 
there's often an inciting event. So sometimes you'll, you'll be talking with patients who have spontaneous intracranial hypotension, or I'm going to call it SIH throughout the rest of the talk. And they'll tell you that there was uh, some sort of inciting event like a fall or lifting something heavy that then led to the symptoms. And then finally, hypotension, which I think is maybe the worst term in this um, in this uh, in this disease entity. And the assumption here is that uh, we have low CSF pressure. But as we're going to find out, that's not always the case uh, for patients with this diagnosis. And so I wasn't taught about SIH in medical school, and neither were my residents at Duke until really very recently. And as my pathology professor once told me, you'll never diagnose a disease that you don't know about, right? And so this is one of the reasons why there's pervasive misdiagnosis of this entity. In fact, in this one landmark publication by Dr. Shevink, a colleague of mine at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles in California, um, over 90% of patients are initially misdiagnosed with diagnostic delays of up to 13 years. We have a, a very large referral center here for treatment of SIH at Duke, and we see patients from all over the, the world. Uh, it, is, it is not uncommon that uh, patients have seen upwards of 20 different physicians and had multiple surgeries um, uh, treating other uh, diagnoses and were misdiagnosed for quite a while before we identify that they actually have SIH. And so how do people with SIH present? Well, uh, most commonly, they'll present with something called an orthostatic headache. And so this is a headache that occurs with the, when they stand upright, but then when they lay down, it gets better. Now, not every patient has to have a headache to have SIH, and not all patients with SIH have orthostatic headaches, but this is the most common presentation. In addition to that, though, they get a myriad of variably present cranial nerve symptoms. So they'll get visual changes, most common blurred vision or, or diplopia. Uh, they'll very commonly dis, uh, describe vertigo or disequilibrium, tinnitus, uh, or cognitive dysfunction. So patients will uh, state that they've got challenges with memory uh, and they can't think as clearly. They'll, they'll describe it as a brain fog. But in addition to that, there's all sorts of additional symptoms that can happen with SIH, and they're really variably present. Each of these independent symptoms leads them to see a different physician. So for instance, the tinnitus, they may go to see an otolaryngologist or the visual changes to an ophthalmologist. And each of those doctors is usually really narrowed in on their particular symptom profile that they're trying to treat uh, and may not know about SIH, which leads to or contributes to the pervasive misdiagnosis. Um, so where did this all start? The very first physician to have mentioned or described the concept of low CSF pressure or volume as a problem is Georg Scheltenbrand. And in 1938, uh, he reported on the potential for something called spontaneous elicoria and reported a single patient with low CSF pressures. So that was a long time ago. And that was in the German literature. It wasn't until uh, 1960, where the, or, or uh, 1958 rather, where there was the first mention in the English literature by Dr. Schenken in neurology. And then it wasn't until 1960 uh, where uh, William Bell first postulated what could be the cause of low CSF pressure and postulated, I think very reasonably, that there may be inhibited secretory activity of the choroid plexus decreasing spinal fluid formation. It turns out that's not actually the pathophysiology of what's happening in SIH patients, as we'll find out. Uh, in 1970, Lassiter published in Headache for the first time uh, the, the, the cause that we, that we know currently, uh, that uh, on a myelography, he noted that there was contrast leaking out of the dura through a tear at a nerve root sleeve, and this was resulting in low CSF volume. Um, Philip Grockengauer, Roger rather, um, and Peter Brownbridge in 1987 reported for the first time successful treatment of a CSF leak, a spontaneous CSF leak using an epidural blood patch. Um, and is that then in 1988, another landmark um, point along the timeline is the development of the ICHD criteria, the International Classification of Headache Disorders criteria. And so the first iteration of this in the late 80s talked about post lumbar puncture headaches or iatrogenic CSF leaks, but there's no mention of a spontaneous CSF leak. So this is not even on anybody's radar as a potential source of headache. And then along came uh, the, the late and great Dr. Mokri at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, Dr. Mokri discovered that this was a problem in his neurology clinic and um, really began to kind of um, look into this concept of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, publishing 45 papers over the course of 23 years. 
And in a lot of respects, he was really a lone voice kind of crying in the wilderness here and no one really uh, kind of took on what what he was um, what he was bringing up. Uh, it turns out a lot of the things that he had discovered were correct. And through a lot of his efforts um, in 2004, so many years later, the second criteria for ICHD finally now includes spontaneous low CSF pressure. And there are some diagnostic criteria uh, listed here, not all of which uh, we use today. So it originally required the presence of an orthostatic headache, required that it wasn't an iatrogenic leak, it wasn't due to surgery or a lumbar puncture, and it required that it resolved after an epidural blood patch. And, and so, so uh, items A and C are fundamentally problematic um, as we kind of move forward. Um, the other things that you needed are a positive brain MRI, which we're going to discuss, low CSF pressure, or a, a documentation of a CSF leak on imaging. So let me pause here. That's a little bit of the background history, but I want to talk for a second about myocardial infarction. You might be wondering, why is a neuroradiologist from Duke talking about myocardial infarction? Well, the, the reason I want to talk about this is everything in medicine starts somewhere. In the early 1900s, uh, myocardial infarction was actually viewed as a wound of the heart. And actually in JAMA, the, the real big journal JAMA, right, they published that uh, the correct treatment was quiet and physical, quiet physical and emotional rest. So they were placed in rooms far away from the nurse's station in the dark with no monitoring or medication for six weeks. Turns out that didn't work very well. Flash forward to 100 years later, right? And the, the latest review articles in JAMA are talking about myocardial reperfusion and a priority is placed on rapid diagnosis through ECGs, blood work, and biomarkers for MI like troponins, rapid door to balloon time, emphasis on reperfusion, invasive, intensive telemetry afterwards, and monitoring in the intensive care unit. So how did our cardiology colleagues go from putting patients in the dark in 1912 to this, uh, to this new paradigm that they've got today? And that's really through research, right? And so that's, that's kind of where we are. We're not quite in the dark of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, but we are working our way through that. And, you know, I think there's kind of the fog of war, so to speak, in the very beginning as we try to figure out what's going on. Uh, and so when we're confronted with a new pathophysiology and new diagnosis, to deal with that uncertainty, we really need to consider the levels of the evidence, right? Uh, how do, it's really how we confirm our findings, establish truth, and then hopefully convince others that this is the right way to diagnose and treat patients. So uh, let me step away, step back from that tangent and go back to our uh, slide here where we have the ICHD2 criteria. And we're going to step through this um, uh, in terms of the diagnostic criteria. So first, let's talk about the positive brain MRI. So on an MRI of the brain with contrast, one of the very first signs that was described by Dr. Mokri and his colleagues in 1991 was diffuse smooth pachymeningeal enhancement, which we're seeing here, a dural enhancement. This is very different than enhancement of the leptomeninges. So the leptomeninges, the arachnoid and pia mater, will go into the sulci like this, whereas the pachymeningeal enhancement is this smooth diffuse enhancement that is along the inner table of the calvarian, that's the dura. And I've seen that mistaken many times before where this imaging characteristic or appearance will be called meningitis and will lead to a lumbar puncture to remove fluid. It was a very common uh, mistake that was made, but this is really nothing else other than intracranial hypotension. Uh, in addition to that, we can sometimes see enlargement of the pituitary gland, right? So um, I've seen patients who have had pituitary, uh, quote unquote, tumors biopsied when it was actually just an enlarged pituitary due to intracranial hypotension. And then another sign that uh, has been described is by Dr. Farb et al. in Toronto, uh, this was a really nice study where they did a case control design, identifying sensitivity and specificity of this sign of about 94% for patients with SIH, and this is called the venous distension sign. So if we look at uh, our transverse sinus here at the level of the globe, we can see that there is a convexity to the undersurface of that transverse sinus, indicating distension of the sinus, whereas the normal sinus is usually uh, concave, so, so it's the opposite direction. This is one that I use all the time. I think it's actually quite helpful. So why is all this happening? Um, and that's because of the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis, right, which states basically that the intracranial space is fixed and the internal contents remain in constant total volume. Now, you'll have to forgive me for this oversimplification, but this is basically what is happening. We've got our calvarium, venous blood, 
the brain and CSF. And obviously it's way more complicated than this, but this is the, this is the general concept. And so what happens in the setting of CSF hypovolemia is the brain really doesn't change shape very much or volume. And so you get a shifting in this direction, leading to enlargement of the venous spaces. This is why we get dural enhancement, enlargement of the pituitary gland, the venous distension sign. Okay. And so this is one of the, one of the uh, core things to remember when looking at the imaging for SIH. If it gets really bad, you can end up with a vacuum phenomena that leads to bilateral subdural effusions. Uh, and this is what this looks like on an MR. So here, here to the left, we've got a non-contrasted head CT. We see these small, uh, low-density effusions. And on flare, we see bilateral subdural collections as well. I've seen these evacuated over and over again multiple times. Uh, it doesn't work very well. It fills right back up. Um, and so this is a pitfall that we want to be aware of in our patients, particularly when we see a younger patient who's had long-standing headaches that's coming in with bilateral subdurals that don't have that high density that we expect for acute blood and we don't have a history of trauma. Another pitfall that we've seen is differentiating between a Chiari 1 malformation and spontaneous intracranial hypotension. So on the left here is a Chiari 1 uh, sagittal T1 weighted image and on the right SIH. And why might these be confused? Well, both patients will present with occipital headaches. And on imaging for both patients, they will both have inferior cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, right? So downward descent of the tonsils below the foramen uh, magnum here. So if we draw our line here from the basian to the epistheon, in both cases, we're going to see that we'll get measurements of five millimeters or greater, depending on the case. But the fundamental pathophysiology is different, right? Uh, Curry 1 can really kind of be conceptualized as a small uh, posterior fossa. Um, effectively creating driving forces in this direction. But the pathophysiology of SIH is one of low CSF volume. And so you actually get downward displacement of all the brain structures, including the midbrain, which is really key to differentiating between QRE1 and SIH. So if we spend a lot of time zooming in here in the midbrain, and we'll do that on both of these, we see some real fundamental differences. I think the real key here is that if we were to draw a line along the floor of the third ventricle, it should be upsloping from anterior to posterior. And that's what we see in a normal brain. And that's also what we see in a QRI1 malformation because there's no midbrain sagging. Look what happens in SIH, downward displacement from anterior to posterior because we've got sagging in the midbrain. And that is really key. In addition to that, we'll see flattening of the pons here and then I think one of the uh, very helpful signs is if you can identify the mammillary bodies and the pons, the distance between the mammillary and the body and the pons is greatly decreased in the setting of SIH, typically less than 5.5 millimeters. This is a paper by Dr. Lube de Shah and colleagues at the University of Utah uh, showing this cutoff value. And so this is really showing us downward descent of the midbrain, which is another brain sagging, basically another really key finding. So what happens in the setting of SIH misdiagnosis? I just showed you all the signs right here. Look at this. This is the mammillary body, pons, the mammal pontine distance is really small, flattening of the pons, right? We, this, is, this is an SIH case. Well, what happens when you have misdiagnosis? It leads to a Chiari decompression, right? In a patient who didn't need it. Clearly, this patient has SIH. They don't get better, right? Because you, you're not fixing the spinal CSF leak. So we don't want to have a suboccipital craniectomy in a Chiari 1 patient. I've seen uh, this exact thing happen in about uh, 30 to 40 of my patients with SIH. It's a very common problem. Fortunately, it's becoming less and less common as, uh, as, as uh, others are becoming aware of this potential for misdiagnosis. Uh, here's a pretty dramatic case, just sort of to drive home the point. This was shared with me, courtesy of Dr. Mike Hazenfield, who's at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio here in the United States. This is a patient on a sagittal T2 uh, weighted MR. You can see downward uh, displacement or downward descent of the third ventricular floor and a narrowing of that uh, mammalopontine distance, right? We actually even see a pre-searing sear. There's an inferior cerebellar tonsillar ectopia. This was misdiagnosed as a QRA1. The patient uh, underwent decompression and herniated through the defect and, and died. Uh, so a really terrible case, extremely rare outcome, but one to sort of hammer home the importance of not uh, uh, making this misdiagnosis or just not being able to differentiate between the two. It's a paper uh, that our group published in the, the Journal of Neurosurgery, uh, looking at lots of different measurements between patients with SIH and QRA1. I won't bore you with all the granular details of that. You can look these up. But, um, but basically, uh, what I think some of the important ones are is that if you look at um, these two measurements, uh, 
So the slope of the floor ventricle, the floor of the third ventricular floor, um, if it's uh, the slope is uh, negative 15 degrees, that's a good cutoff line between SIH and QRA1. And measuring the pontomesencephalic angle, which is shown here, uh, that is also significantly reduced in SIH patients. Again, this is all getting around that central concept of midbrain sagging. So you should be looking at that mammalopontine distance uh, to get a good sense of that. And so this was a good cutoff at 45 degrees for this other sign. Okay, so if I was going to leave you with one take-home message from the diagnostic components of the brain, it would be this, that there is sagging of the brain, enhancement of the dura, not leptomeningeal enhancement, but pachymeningeal enhancement, engorgement of the venous sinuses, pituitary enlargement in the subdurals, which leads to a really nice mnemonic of SEEPS, right? And a great way to remember this. Uh, our group at Duke looked at patients who definitively had SIH based on positive myelograms, and we looked at what's the incidence, what's the prevalence of each of these signs in patients who we knew had SIH. And here's what we found. Only 61% had brain sagging, about three quarters had venous distension, and 83% had dural enhancement or enlargement of the pituitary. That left about eight to 9% of our patients, 7% of our patients that did not have a positive brain MRI, despite having a definitive CSF leak on imaging and classic symptoms consistent with SIH. And so uh, a negative brain MRI can exclude SIH, but most patients will have a positive brain MRI. So that's the brain imaging. How about the next thing that was in the ICHD2 criteria and the CSF pressure of less than six? I mean, that's in the name, right? At the outset, I showed you the flat tire sign, and that's the hypotension piece. And so the expectation actually is that there was low pressure. In fact, some of the diagnostic criteria required a pressure of less than six, of so normal being, depending on who you ask, being you know 12 to 22 or 15 to 20. Here's a group of patients uh, at Duke that we saw who had SIH, and these are the pressures that we see. So about a third of patients do have a pressure less than six, but most patients actually have pressures that fall within the normal range or slightly lower than normal. Um, and so if you use that strict cutoff of six, you're going to exclude about two thirds of patients who have SIH, which I think is another cause of misdiagnosis. I've uh, heard from many of my patients before that they'll have a lumbar puncture performed in the neurologist's office to measure the pressure. And if it's greater than six, uh, they, they had been told in the past that they don't have this problem. There are even some patients who had high pressures. You can see 5% in this series between 20 and 25, but we've seen people who have active CSF leaks and definitive spontaneous intracranial hypotension on brain MRI with pressures as high as the upper 30s. And so a high pressure does not exclude this diagnosis either. And so this is really a myth is that uh, people with SIH need to have low pressures. That's not necessarily the case. Here's uh, a, a single case study, which is admittedly low level evidence, but I think it's an interesting case and one that we've seen over and over again. This was a 40 year old female with a BMI of uh, 36. Uh, she had uh, symptomatic idiopathic intracranial hypertension and she underwent a Valsalva maneuver uh, or, uh, and, and then that led to a substantial change in her symptoms. She then developed orthostatic headache and had a pretreatment MRI of the brain that now was positive for spontaneous intracranial hypotension. She also had an MRI of the spine that showed a large volume CSF leak here um, that's running up and down the entirety of the spine, including both the ventral and dorsal aspect of the thoracic spine, confirming the presence of a CSF leak. Um, of, of interest, her local neurologist had actually discontinued her diamox right before this causative Valsalva maneuver. So her, her high pressure was no longer being treated. When she presented to Duke for treatment, uh, we did a lumbar puncture and measured her opening pressure and it was 27. So despite this large leak, uh, she still had a high pressure. We then did a myelogram. And so here you can see uh, an axial image from a CT myelogram and that demonstrates the presence of a CSF leak here. You see contrast leaking out along the dorsal aspect of the spine. And then we did something called a dynamic myelogram, and I'll talk a little bit about this spine imaging in a bit. Uh, here you can see contrast leaking out from the axilla of this nerve root sleeve, confirming the presence of a CSF leak. Uh, she then went on to be uh, patched and was treated, and her symptoms resolved, and her SIH resolved as well. And so uh, she subsequently developed severe rebound intracranial hypertension, kind of reverting back to her high pressure situation. And this has been refractory to medications. And so she may even need a shunt. And so I, I think this concept uh, I wanted to bring up because I think CSF pressures are really two sides of a coin here, right? And it's influenced by several different things. 
Yes, CSF volume is involved, but there are other variables that are likely as play, at play, including dural compliance. So that can be influenced by connective tissues disorders, for instance. We know that people with Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan syndrome are more likely to get these spontaneous leaks, but also CSF production and resorption rates, right? So high pressure patients may be prone to CSF leaks. Um, and then uh, keep in mind that there are there are a few things we don't know much about, right? So uh, some of the epidural venous structures uh, may, uh, for instance, the venous structures may dilate like a blood pressure cuff to effectively increase the, the uh, CSF volume and prop up the pressure in the setting of CSF leak. And that may not always be represented by some of our measurements. Uh, a while back, we converted to using digital manometers, uh, which is shown here. Uh, these actually have been quite accurate compared to the annual measurement technique, and they save us an awful lot of time. Uh, so, uh, you know, just just a plug for that. I, I think that's actually quite useful. Um, one thing that I've seen many times before is we've had patients uh, sent to us from multiple states away from the other side of the country due to a low pressure measurement. Um, and then when we measure the pressure, it's normal. So this patient and their family have had really a, a, a pretty considerable trip and financial burden placed on them. And then you talk to the patient, you say, well, you know, your pressure is normal. Tell me about uh, the doctor that did your pressure back home in Montana. And they'll say, well, they, they came into the room, they did the pressure in two seconds, and they left really quickly. You know, presumably they were in a big rush. And so with that analog manometer where you're waiting for the, the CSF to kind of go up the manometer, sometimes people are unwilling to wait for an accurate pressure measurement. So the digital manometer can be quite helpful in that regard. All right, so let's move on to uh, imaging of the CSF leaks. And so this is where your radiologist colleagues really kind of come into play. We are really looking for three types of CSF leaks. SIH is uh, by and large caused by a spinal CSF leak in the vast majority of cases, 99 plus percent of the time. Um, and there are three types. The first is shown here. This is a nerve root sleeve diverticular leak. This occurs uh, due to a denuding of the normal dura leading to the more friable arachnoid matter extending through that defect as shown here and then that arachnoid matter uh, tears leading to a CSF leak okay and so here's what this looks like these are some myelograms of a patient of mine at Duke here we have contrast in the subarachnoid space this is the spinal cord and the spinal column and as I scroll through here you'll see that when we get to the causative uh, level that there's contrast that continues just below that nerve root sleeve and that shouldn't happen here if we show this to you in the coronal plane, I think you see this to even better advantage. Uh, here I'm scrolling through. And right here is our causative nerve root sleeve with contrast that extends just below the nerve root sleeve in the axilla. Let's see if we can run this, you'll see contrast extending right below that, right? And so that's, that's not normal. And so this is an example of what a CSF leak due to a nerve root sleeve diverticular leak looks like. With our myelography technique, we'll place contrast into the subarachnoid space, inject the contrast, and then take some pictures. And sometimes, you know, if we take the pictures um, in too much of a delayed fashion, we'll end up with this, this scenario where we've got contrast that's spilled out uh, beyond the dura in an extradural location that runs up and down the entirety of the spine. In that scenario, we don't quite know where the leak is coming from. We just know that the patient has one. In this case, we suspect that it was coming from this nerve root sleeve due to the increased contrast density. And so we use something called dynamic myelography to demonstrate this technique here as a video. The patient lays ipsilateral to the side in question. You inject contrast and use a tilting table taking radiographs as you go. And you can see that the contrast is spilling out from that nerve root sleeve. This was a patient with Marfan syndrome who needed surgical correction of that leak. So that's the first type of CSF leak that we look for. The second type is shown here, it's caused by a, a disc osteophyte spur. So this is a degenerative osteophyte that has a degenerative, uh, disc degenerative change rather, that has associated with it a, 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 a spicule of bone as shown here that then penetrates the dura leading to a tear in a CSF leak. So on our myelogram in this particular patient, we can see that contrast was uh, spilling out basically everywhere, all up and down the spine. But I did identify this spicule right here, thought that that could be potentially the site of the leak. We again use the dynamic myelography technique. Now this is a lateral projection radiograph with the patient laying prone. We injected contrast, tilted the table down, and I uh, took a series of radiographs and you can see that the contrast splits right here, uh, right at the site where that osteophyte was, confirming that that's the site of the leak. Here's another example. This is a patient with an osteophyte spur that's a T4-5. Uh, we did a digital subtraction myelogram. So what that technique uh, does is it's very similar to that dynamic myelogram that I showed you, but it employs an initial mask. So you take an initial image and then subtract uh, 
that initial image pre-contrast from every post-contrast image. So it gets rid of all the bone and the, and the structures behind it and allows just the contrast behind it. You can see this nice split or Y of contrast here at T45 confirming that that's the site of the leak. And I think we have a couple surgeons on the call, so there's some intraoperative pictures here. This is a, this is a, a case here where this is an intradural approach with re retraction of the thoracic cord. This little uh, spick, uh, pearly um, substance here is actually the discosteophyte spur, and this is the ventral dural defect that went on to repair. Here's what a video of this looks like on a digital subtraction myelogram, just so you can see the contrast runs up, and then boom, it splits right there, confirming that that's the site of the ventral leaks. And so this is what we're looking for, and then the patient can be go on, go on to, to treatment or targeted or directed to that level. When we do our CT myelograms and we have large volumes of contrast that spill up and down the entirety of the spine, confirming that there's a leak, but we don't know where it comes from, sometimes we are then in a situation where we need to say, well, what additional imaging do we need to do to try to identify the exact level? But this is some of the harder stuff that, that we do at Duke in terms of trying to find the exact level. You can't send a, a neurosurgeon in for surgery at every level in the spine, so we need to identify the disc level, right? So what we can do is we can use the contrast gradient to narrow down the z-axis or the cranial caudal dimension at which the disc might be causing the problem. And so what you can see here is there is a ventral CSF leak. The patient is laying prone here on these axial images. And this is contrast in the ventral epidural space that's extending up and down the spine. So this, this part right, right here is the normal contrast dorsal to the cord. And so this is our CSF leak. Note that the CSF leak that my yellow arrows are pointing to increases in density as we extend superiorly in the spine toward the cranio, uh, cranio cervico thoracic junction rather. And so that suggests to me that the CSF leak is likely arising at the cervico thoracic junction using that contrast gradient, right? Because our contrast started in the normal subarachnoid space and then spilled out through a hole to fill that ventral CSF leak. It therefore is most equivalent in density to the true subarachnoid space at the craniocervical junction. Sorry, I keep saying that the cervical thoracic junction, suggesting that that's where the neural defect is. We can then go on to use secondary imaging, and one of the really nice ones that was invented by my colleagues at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, is something called an ultra-fast or dynamic CT myelography technique. And so, in this case, you actually pay, place the patient on a series of wedges or pillows on the CT scanner, do a lumbar puncture and then rapidly acquire CT scans back and forth while injecting contrast, hoping to capture the exact moment when the contrast spills through the dural defect, as we did in this case. So this is one of the runs uh, during an ultra fast CT myelogram that I did on one of my patients. And you can see that there's normal contrast in the uh, spinal canal and the subarachnoid space inferiorly. And then as we get to the six, seven level, there's that split again, indicating that that's the site of the ventral dural defect and allowing for targeted therapy. Here's an example, uh, several examples of uh, what this looks like intraoperatively. And so this is courtesy of Dr. Wouter Shevink, um, who is a uh, very famous neurosurgeon in the world of spontaneous intracranial hypotension out at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, California. And these all look the same. There's these little oval defects along the ventral aspect of the dura indicating, uh, or uh, which, which then can be repaired, uh, leading to a cure. So that's the first two types of leaks. The third type I think is the most interesting, and that is a CSF to venous fistula. So what this is, is a pathologic connection between the normal CSF containing space around nerve root sleeve and an adjacent paraspinal vein. What's challenging about them is they are usually not associated with a little collection of CSF or a true CSF leak. Rather, instead, it's just uh, unregulated egress of CSF right back into the bloodstream, leading to CSF hypovolemia or low volume. So they're, they're, they are therefore exceedingly challenging to identify. And in fact, we didn't know that they existed until this landmark publication by the Cedar sinai Group in 2014. So prior to 2014, all of the SIH patients with CSF to venous fistulas, we would really just never find the leak and not understand uh, what the cause of their symptoms were. What are we looking for in order to find them? Well, we're using contrasted examinations like myelography and trying to identify subtle uptake of contrast into the adjacent paraspinal veins, which we've termed the hyperdense paraspinal vein sign.
So this is what this looks like here. This is a spot radiograph magnified around a nerve root sleeve. And you can see that there's contrast extending into an adjacent vein. This is what it looks like on a coronal CT myelogram. And then here's a hyperdense paraspinal vein. You can see that there's contrast being taken up into this adjacent vein, confirming the presence of a CSF to venous fistula. Here's a few maximum intensity projection images, uh, I think showing this to better advantage here. Uh, we can see dense contrast in, an, in the uh, normal nerve root sleeve that then extends into the adjacent paraspinal vein, confirming the presence of a hyperdense paraspinal vein sign and the CSF to venous fistula at that level. Now, these can be really hard to see. Uh, this is a patient who had suffered uh, from SIH for about five years had been to several other academic centers in the United States. Uh, some of them were very, very good centers, and they could not find the leak. The patient sent uh, all of their imaging to our institution for review, and I looked at them, you know, tens of thousands of images. And on this one image, this is the only thing that I saw, was this little tiny dot lateral to that left pedicle. And I said, I, I thought to myself, well, I don't know what that is. That looks funny to me, though. I wonder if she has a fistula. So we put this patient uh, laying on their side and did a myelogram with them in that decubitus position. And I think this movie shows to really nice advantage the, how important it is to have decubitus imaging there. Uh, so this was a really impressive case. This is one of the very first ones where we noticed that this is an important technique. You can see that here with the patient laying on their side, really dense contrast here in the ipsilateral aspect of the lateral fecal sac extending into the nerve foramen and then the contrast drives into the venous system here i think we can see that hyperdense paraspinal vein to even better advantage in the coronal plane here's a paraspinal vein right there note that on the contralateral side there's no hyperdensity right this is abnormal uptake of contrast into the vein indicating a hyperdense paraspinal vein sign and so that is uh that was curative for this patient she was able to go on a surgery uh, leading to a cure and so uh, from this case we discovered that decubitus uh, imaging was really critical for identifying these fistulas because we really need very dense contrast in those neuroframen in order to identify uh, the hyperdense paraspinal vein along the way uh, we have all uh, uh, been working to try to figure out better ways to identify these sometimes exceedingly um, subtle fistulas. And we've discovered that the conspicuity of the fistulas seems to be related to the phase of the respiratory cycle at which we acquire the imaging, which I think makes logical sense, right? During inspiratory phase, we're going to have increased venous return which may uh, pull contrast from the CSF space and in, into the adjacent veins. And so we found that we're more likely to see these with uh, patients um, uh, with imaging acquired with a patient in inspiration rather than expiration or Valsalva. More recently, and this was a publication only two years ago, more recently, um, colleagues of ours at UCSF published this very interesting uh, early work where they looked at the differences between the CSF pressure and the venous pressure at different phases of the respiratory cycle in Valsalva, normal inspiration, and then using a technique called resisted inspiration in which the patient actually breathes in through a uh, little syringe, create almost like, like a like, or a bent straw, uh, creating some challenges in, in kind of um, sucking in the air. That's called resisted inspiration. And what's really key, right, you would think for finding these fistulas is the greatest delta or greatest difference in pressure with the highest pressures in the CSF space uh, relative to the venous space. And we actually found here, they found here that the greatest difference was during this resisted inspiration. So this is a technique that we've begun to employ here at Duke and at the Mayo Clinic and some of these other centers in an effort to try to better improve the conspicuity of these fistulas. We recently uh, had the good fortune of uh, acquiring a photon counting CT at Duke, and this is an, a next generation CT scanner that offers improved spatial resolution and signal to noise ratio, as well as lower radiation uh, doses, and allows us to do something called materials differentiation. And we found this to be extremely helpful for the identification of fistulas in some patients who we know have SIH based on their brain imaging and their symptoms, but we can't find their leak. And we assume it's gotta be a fistula. This was the first case that uh, we, we, were, we uh, found the fistula on where we weren't able to find it using conventional methods. You can see that you really can't see a fistula here on the regular scanner, and we can see it using the photon counting CT. And this is an iodine only map here where we're seeing the contrast. Um, and this was very helpful 
uh, due to the superior spatial resolution. We have multiple additional cases where that's uh, the case here. This is another one. You can, really can't see the fistula around the nerve root sleeve here on the left, which is the normal scanner. And our photon canning scanner, you can see this really subtle fistula tubular contrast going into an adjacent vein there that we just really couldn't see otherwise. So this is a very exciting and new technology that we're hoping will be helpful in finding some of these subtle fissures that we can't otherwise find. So some of the challenges that we run into in terms of identifying either the location or the location of the CSF leak come down to really two fundamental problems. We A, either can't localize the origin of the leak. So we see, we know they have a leak. We see contrast spilling out all over the place, but we can't figure out what level it's coming from, or we just can't find it. So I know they have uh, a spinal CSF leak, and I know they have SIH based on their brain imaging, but I don't see anything on the myelogram. And so that really comes down to challenges of temporal resolution or conspicuity, right? And so we need to do things to improve our imaging uh, toward both of those ends. And I've talked a little bit about what some of those things are as well uh, in terms of that photon counting CT and the dynamic imaging. Okay, so in 2018, kind of uh, piggybacking on a lot of the work that multiple groups have done, the latest version of the International Classification of Headache Disorders now has headache attributed to SIH that is much more simplified. Patients either have to have a low pressure, less than six, or they have a CSF leak on imaging. So this is much broader inclusion criteria. You don't have to have low pressure. It can be normal if you have a positive brain MRI. Uh, likewise, you don't have to have positive imaging. You can have SIH if your pressure is less than six. In addition to that, they do not need to respond to a blood patch. They don't need to be cured by a blood patch. And they actually don't need to have an orthostatic headache anymore. They just need to have a, a headache or symptoms uh, that is secondary to that low pressure or the leak. And of course, it can't be iatrogenic. So that's basically the diagnostic components. What do we do when we find a patient with SIH and we identify the leak? How do we treat them? Well, there, uh, for the longest time, there really were there are three broad approaches, conservative therapy, patching, and surgery. And so conservative measures uh, include bed rest, hydration, caffeine, abdominal binders. They, by and large, don't work great. And so these have been the two mainstays at the major referral centers, epidural blood patching and surgery. And I'll start with the discussion of patching. Patching, I think, can really be conceptualized as almost like spackling. You're trying to cover a hole. And so uh, this is a very broad simplification. But on this little diagram here, we have our spinal cord, our blue CSF, the uh, dura, and then the epidural fat. And what we do for a blood patch is we take our needle and put it into the epidural space. And then we take the patient's own blood in a sterile manner and inject it into that space. It covers the dural hole and seals the leak. And so who came up with this, what, what I think seemingly crazy idea to fix a CSF leak by taking some blood from a patient and injecting it into the spine? Well, uh, the first kind of descriptions of this were by Dr. Gormley in 1960, and he noted that the postural puncture headaches that people would get after lumbar puncture were much less likely after a bloody lumbar puncture or bloody tap. And so he treated seven cases with autologous patches. Uh, that seems to have gone, that, that had little, wasn't noticed very much basically. And it was about a decade later, later when D. Giovanni um, in anesthesia and analgesia published uh, a case series of five patients where they successfully treated post lumbar puncture headaches. The first time that SIH was ever treated was with an epidural blood patch was in 1987. And that's actually still what we're doing today. We still do blood patches at Duke, but there's been some modifications of the technique. So some of the technical considerations, the first thing you have to consider is, are you going to do a targeted patch or non targeted? Are you going to direct the, the um, patching material to the site of the CSF leak or not? Right? And so it would stand a reason most people think, well, yeah, you got to do targeted, right? And that makes sense, but that does require that you find the leak first, right? And so it involves a lot of uh, subspecialty expertise to be able to find the leak to be able to do that. And so if we had uh, a definitive answer about the comparative efficacy, that would be quite helpful. The other question is, well, what are you going to use? Almost everybody uses autologous blood, but some people use fibrin glue as well. And we think that that can increase the efficacy of the patch. And so this is a pharmaceutical product. This is an off-label use of the product, but it's a combination of uh, factors at the end of the blood, blood clotting cascade to create fibrin glue monomers. This is what they look like, very similar to physiologic fibrin. Uh, and it comes in this uh, dual syringe uh, kit where you inject uh, through this little Y connector uh, into the patient. Uh, in creating a patch. I, we usually do that at Duke along with blood. So we'll use both blood and fibrin glue. Uh, 
So here's an example of what that treatment looks like. Let's say uh, for the purposes of this example, this is a nerve root sleeve leak. Uh, this was where the leak was right here. I took a needle under CT fluoroscopic guidance and ran it into the neuroforamen very carefully. Once we get into that position, we use a little bit of uh, radiographic contrast to make sure we're in a safe position to then deliver our patching material in a targeted fashion right to the site of the leak. Um, this is what this looks like. So here's a video of, of uh, let me play this video here. This is a video of us treating a left T11 nerve root sleeve leak. We run the needle right next to where the leak was, inject contrast, confirm it's a safe spot, and then go ahead and put in a bunch of patching material and kind of cover that nerve root sleeve in order to create uh, a seal of the nerve root uh, sleeve leak. Sometimes we have leaks of the ventral neural space, which is what I showed you before, this type 2 leak due to an osteophyte spur. These can be a little harder to treat, right? Because if we're trying to do this percutaneously in radiology, we've got to get our needles to the anterior aspect of the spinal canal, which is quite challenging, right? And so we basically have to run our needle past the spinal cord uh, and the neuroforamen and some of the, even the radiculomedullary arteries, which may be supplying blood to the cord and then deliver patching material there. To do that, uh, we usually do the following. We will very carefully run our needle through the foramen. We have the patient uh, awake there under moderate sedation so we can communicate with them. And then we course underneath the nerve in order to get access to the ventral epidural space. This usually requires bilateral needle placements, as I'm showing you here, in order to try to get coverage across the ventral epidural surface. It's a, it's a technically challenging um, uh, procedure. As we do this, I take care to recognize the fact that the radiculomedullary arteries uh, tend to live in the superior anterior aspect of the foramen. So if we're going to make this approach, we try and come in from the inferior aspect of the foramen to not hit an artery that might be supplying the spinal cord. We've probably done those needle placements over a thousand times and um, uh, thankfully have not had any complications to date. Uh, and so that is uh, one option for treating those patients. The alternative is actually quite, quite a lengthy surgery. Our group has been working toward developing a needle where we can kind of have a curved tip to it uh, with a nitinol intercannula that might improve the delivery of our patching materials to the ventral epidural surface and hopefully keep some patients out of the operating room. It is quite a big surgery to seal these, these ventral leaks. And so we're hoping in the future that uh, some of this technology may be uh, useful for treating these patients. At Duke, we use a lot of CT fluoroscopy guidance. And so we can do some very clever approaches like going through facet joints, at the cervicothoracic junction, we have gone through costovertebral joints to try to treat leaks. Uh, and uh, for those who, um, this is really not for the faint of heart, but we have actually treated ventral cervical leaks by going through the uncovertebral joint uh, as well. But when patching fails, then we need to move on to surgical approaches. And there are a couple of different surgical approaches. A colleague of ours uh, at Duke, uh, Dr. Christopher Brown provided these videos, and these are an extradural approach. What he does is he gets exposure, he keeps the dura intact, uses a rongeur to take off the osteophyte spur, and then uh, creates a graft that's custom for the patient that he then wraps around the dura in order to seal the ventral leak. He, he calls this a sushi wrap, uh, wraps it around, and then oversews uh, the hole. In addition to that, there is the more traditional intradural approach that Dr. Shevink uh, uses out at Cedar sinai Here he's actually uh, dissected or cut open the dorsal aspect of the dura, and he's uh, translocating the cord ever so slightly and carefully, um, and then identifying this ventral leak, which he then sews, sews down. The disadvantage of this approach, right, is it's a lot harder to take down the osteophyte spur. The disadvantage of the extradural approach is that you can't directly visualize the dural defect, right? And so I think there are pluses and minuses. And this is an area which I think uh, needs some further investigation about which approach is better. For treating CSF to venous fistulas, uh, our surgeons uh, typically will get exposure and then use electrocautery to cauterize all of the veins. They will then also place a very large aneurysm clip uh, typically to ligate the nerve root. Uh, patients end up with a, a defect, a dermatomal defect, a sensory defect, but they're happy to trade that for resolution of their SIH symptoms. So those were really the mainstays of therapy until about a year and a half ago when Dr. Brinjicki at the Mayo Clinic developed a very, uh, very uh, I think, intelligent and, and interesting procedure for treating CSF to venous fistulas in particular. And so what uh, they're doing here is actually getting uh, catheter access to the venous side and getting to the fistula and then using onyx embolization uh, in order to basically seal off the fistula. And so he's got all these really beautiful articles in AJNR and some of the other 
uh, publications, I think in uh, JNS as well. Uh, here you can see he gets uh, uh, Venus side access, blows up a balloon and uh, puts onyx into that space, creating a cast to get rid of the fistula. This is, this is, I think, a promising new therapy that may help to keep patients out of the OR. So the last little bit of time, I wanted to talk briefly about what the current state of the efficacy is or evidence is with regard to efficacy of treatment of SIH. Uh, our group actually just submitted this paper. This is between, this is a, a, um, a collaboration between the Mayo Clinic and Duke. And what we did is we looked at all the papers that have been published for treatment of SIH. And I think a couple of interesting things come out of it. First of all, there has been a rapid increase in the number of publications in this space over the past <clears throat> decade plus. In fact, it's now landing in JAMA and in a lot of uh, really high level journals. There's a lot of interest in spontaneous intracranial hypotension. What we found is that there are very few studies with higher levels of evidence. Almost everything is a retrospective study uh, using either cohorts or case series. And so the level of evidence is quite low. And so making decisions about comparative efficacies of different treatments, I don't think we're quite there yet. There are no randomized controlled trials, for instance, and no real prospective studies. Um, most of the studies for patching are just on blood alone with very few exploring fibrin glue. And very few studies talk about the targeted approach, directing it right at the site of the leak. And so I don't think we really know the difference about whether targeted or non-targeted approaches are better based on the status of the literature. How about surgery? Well, uh, there is uh, much less published on surgery. And the series that are published usually involve a heterogeneous cohort of patients and different approaches like muscle or fat packing and intradural approaches and extradural approaches all put together and sometimes not even specified what approach is taken. And so I don't think we can quite talk about yet which approach is better yet. But this, but identifying gaps like this provide opportunities for future research. And so I think there's plenty of opportunity for helping to improve the field. In general, the literature uh, it has not been great about identifying uh, whether or not patients definitively had SIH. You, you can see in many cases, we couldn't determine whether or not patients actually had SIH based on ICHD3 criteria. And most prior publications do not report the subtype of CSF leak, which I think is an important point because if there are differences in treatment efficacy between vis venous fistulas versus nerve root sleeve leaks, et cetera, then we would need to know what types of leaks different papers are reporting on uh, to understand the comparative efficacy. Uh, the reporting in terms of the outcomes um, usually involve some sort of patient symptom response, but by far and large, by, by and large, the vast majority of papers usually say something to the effect of patient symptoms improved and it's physician reported uh, interpretation of how patients did. There are very few studies that use a validated measure like NRS or VAS or HIT6 or MIDAS or anything like that. And so there's opportunities for improvement there. Most studies do not report on quality of life, and very few studies uh, really look at improvements in imaging. It's just not something that's commonly done, so I think there's plenty of opportunities for that as well. And so there are some clear recommendations that come out of this. First, uh, if you're going to publish on SIH patients, you should indicate whether or not I, they meet ICHD3 criteria for the diagnosis and explicitly report the subtypes of CSF leaks. Are you talking about fistulas, nerve root sleeve leaks, ventral leaks? And then you should include key procedural details. Did you do targeted patching? What type of surgery did you do? And your out, our outcomes that are reported should be objective and validated at set time points. So most, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneous reporting in terms of time points too, immediate outcomes, uh, one month, et cetera. So we want to have that standardized as well. And so at the end of the day, you know, really what I want to know and what a lot of my research is focused on is what's the best way to make someone with SIH feel better, right? What's the best treatment efficacy? And if you read the literature that I just showed you, it says all sorts of things like this. Epidural blood patch is the gold standard treatment for epidural, for CSF leaks. Uh, it is the most commonly used technique and it, most patients react favorably. And in conclusion, epidural patching is an effective way of treating headache in patients with SIH. And so I don't know if this will land on this audience, but there's this movie, My Cousin Vinny, where he said, how could you be so sure? Uh, uh, and, you know, that's kind of the question, right? How do we know that? If I just showed you the status of the evidence is, is, is no higher level evidence, no prospective studies and kind of poor outcomes. And so I don't think we quite know that yet. And so our group is really working toward that. Um, I had a grant from the Radiology Society of North America uh, where we actually uh, did a sham controlled, randomized controlled trial. And the reason we did that is there's many, many examples 
of cases where there's widespread clinical adoption of a procedure that proceeds robust level one efficacy. So some classic examples um, are some of the vertebroplasty trials where we would do vertebral augmentation. Uh, and then there were these two landmark trials by Dr. Kalmus in the New England Journal of Medicine and Dr. Bookbinder, where they found no difference between the sham procedure and vertebral augmentation. And so this has happened over and over again. Uh, and so it's possible that that's the case with epidural patching as well. And so we ran an initial trial that was really a feasibility trial, uh, randomizing patients to either, uh, with their consent to either uh, true targeted patching or to a sham procedure, uh, a, a, a procedure, a simulated procedure, and then looked at outcomes at set time points using validated measures. We were able to get uh, 15 patients to grac graciously agree to do this, proving that we could do this under feasibility. One of the challenges we ran into is we have patients traveling from as far as New Zealand to come see us in, in North Carolina in the United States. And so long distance travel is very difficult in getting patients to agree to a sham procedure. Understandably, they wouldn't want to do that in some cases. But about 20% of patients who are eligible elected to enroll, which is not too far off from other published sham trials. Uh, we were able to get all of our patients through the primary outcome measure and none were lost to follow up. And we were able to successfully blind them to which arm that they got. So uh, most patients really didn't know what they got. And when they guessed, uh, the ones that guessed were wrong 75% of the time. So there are very few that were able to guess what, uh, what procedure they got. Our results, of course, did not reach statistical significance with only 15 patients, but we are beginning to see a trend towards some efficacy of targeted patching. And so I think we need to kind of do this uh, in earnest moving forward. And so we're hoping uh, to run a multi-center clinical trial. And we have a, a grant uh, at the NIH now uh, with multiple collaborators from around the United States. And, and we're hoping at some point we'll be able to do that uh, in order to kind of answer this question, does targeted patching matter? And what we're gonna do is compare targeted patching to non-targeted patching. I think that's a really important question because if we find out that non-targeted patching has the same efficacy as targeted patching, then it's okay for us to just start with that and not do all those myelographic techniques uh, unless patching fails and we're gonna send the patient to surgery. The standard currently at all of these referral centers is we do this whole diagnostic workup and then do targeted patching uh, and that may not be necessary. Or we may find out that it is necessary, and then that would treat, change the paradigm at community centers, right? They'd be referring to patients, patients to places like Duke uh, more readily to go look for the CSF leak. So uh, that's kind of a whirlwind tour of SIH, and I think the next decade or two are going to be really exciting for this field. We're going to continue to improve our diagnostic abilities. We're going to be working toward the best imaging exams to identify particular CSF leaks. Uh, who knows, maybe we'll develop a blood test uh, similar to troponins and MI to diagnose a CSF leak. Um, we have been working uh, in conjunction with the Stanford uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence and Medicine to develop an AI tool that can identify SIH on brain imaging, uh, which hopefully will reduce some of the misdiagnosis, in, in particular with QRI1 malformation uh, for patients. We're going to see some high quality treatment efficacy studies. The first versions of those are going to come out, uh, usually or most likely in the terms of prospective cohorts first, followed by randomized controlled trials. And hopefully these will be able to compare treatments using validated outcome measures. Um, you know, we've been working also on developing a validated outcome measure specifically for SIH here at Duke in conjunction with the Center for Health Measurements so that will have a tool akin to like a MIDAS or an NRS specifically for SIH so we can best determine comparative efficacies. Um, and really, I think what we need to do is move toward more collaboration uh, currently, as in any field, when we begin, most of the research is in a silo at single institutions. And so we're all working together to develop multi-institutional collaborations. Uh, and I know there's broad interest uh, in doing that in the SIH community in general. So in closing, I do wanna thank and acknowledge my entire Duke team. There's a whole team of us that take care of about four to 500 patients with SIH annually at Duke. It's a very busy practice uh, and I've learned a lot from them uh, and they're really uh, wonderful people. So this is Dr. Linda Gray, who many people know. This is Dr. Peter Kranz, Dr. Malinzak, Dr. Willite, and then Jeff and Hope who are uh, mid-level uh, providers that, that help us uh, to take care of these patients. And uh, many of my research collaborators are shown here. Um, and really, no one can whistle a symphony, right? So you really need an entire orchestra. And so uh, I thank them as well. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your time and attention and happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Amrai. Uh, that was the wonderful presentation.
full of uh, images that were coherent for the beginners as well, um, I think, and the audience, uh, such as students. Thank you so much. For From a point of view of the young neurosurgery, it was um, interesting to hear about the efficacy of this uh, treatment. Uh, and your most, thank you for sharing your, the most recent research of yours. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to read some questions and comments in the chat section with your permission. So Izmir Online and your surgery says explanatory, uh, demonstrative, beautiful photos and videos. Thank you for the brilliant conference. Mm -hmm. I would agree with each and every word. Uh, thank you again. Uh, Dr. Günger Usta uh, says, thank you so much for your clear lecture. My question is, what's the mechanism of spontaneous renorrhea? And is it a reason for the spontaneous intracranial uh, hypertension? Yeah, really great question. Um, there is something called the hydrostatic indifference point, meaning uh, uh, orthostatic headaches uh, really aren't, do not result from leaks at the skull base, because when we stand up intracranially, we actually go to relative negative pressure. And so we don't drive CSF out of the skull base uh, and we don't get an orthostatic headache. So for spontaneous intracranial hypotension, I think it would be reasonable to operate under the general assumption that they are always caused by a leak in the spine. Um, you know, you, it's very difficult to have absolutes in medicine. I'm sure we can find a case somewhere where it was due to a skull base leak, but by and large, they're going to be caused by uh, leaks in the spine. And so I start the answer to that question in, in that manner, but I, I, I think what we need to consider is why are patients getting rhinorrhea and otorrhea? And that actually is due to the opposite problem. It is due to idiopathic intracranial hypertension or high pressure. So there's a very long known, at least in neuroradiology, association between high pressure and something called arachnoid pits. So the arachnoid matter kind of invaginates into the skull base and can sometimes leak. And so it's really clear to me that that's due to high pressure. In fact, we see an awful lot of patients with undiagnosed high pressure as well at our clinic. They have headaches and their neurologist sends them to us thinking it's a CSF leak and we measure their pressure and it's in the 40s. And it's very common that they'll tell us that they've got rhinorrhea associated with that. Um, those types of headaches, the, the patient with high pressure will often tell us that they have headaches that are worst at night and at about two to three in the morning. And one of the reasons for that is that's when our maximum CSF production occurs. It's about two to three in the morning. Uh, and so th that's, a, that's a really common story that we hear. But yeah, I think the rhinorrhea most commonly is due to high pressure. We have seen cases where people will report fluid down the back of their throat that they are swallowing in the setting of SIH. And we think that that's likely due to cranial nerve uh, dysfunction and firing leading to increased secretions on occasion. So if you're encountering that, that could be for that reason. But I think that's much less common. Uh, I think the rhinorrhea is due to IIH or high pressure. Thank you very uh, much. Sorry, uh, Madonna. Yeah, uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, Professor, can you please uh, stop your screen sharing so yes. we can see each other bigger? Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next question is from uh, Dr. Celine Bozdag, uh, uh, our female neurosurgeon from Turkey. I may have missed it. As neurosurgeons, we think of iatrogenic uh, uh, intracranial hypertension easily. However, spontaneous uh, intracranial hypertension is not one of the first preliminary diagnoses in our daily practice. What is the pathognomic anamnesis and examination finding? Can we say I, uh, ICH if we do not see any findings on the MRI, but if the anamnesis and the examination are compatible? ICH intracranial, okay. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the question, uh, yeah. Yeah, very, very good question. Um, you know, what's, what's interesting, right, is that the misdiagnosis rates are actually very, very high for patients with spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, and so I think that, that if you're not looking for it, uh, you know, you may not see it. And I think your point is very well taken if you have a patient with a headache and any concern for CSF leak, the very first step is to get a contrasted brain MRI because in about 90 plus percent of patients that will be positive and will provide the diagnosis for you. And then you can move on to, uh, you know, diagnostic workup and treatment of that diagnosis. However, 
uh, there are seven to eight percent of patients where the brain MRI will be normal despite a CSF leak. And so I think what's very difficult uh, for neurologists and neurosurgeons and clinicians who are seeing these patients in the clinic is deciding which of those patients with a brain MRI to send to a SIH referral center like Duke or elsewhere for additional workup. Because the patient with a normal brain MRI who has SIH, it's only going to be discovered through either a low CSF pressure or through the myelographic imaging, right? And so you're committing the patient and their family to a trip to a different institution and to an invasive workup. So here's uh, what I would recommend is just uh, to understand what you expect to see from a clinical perspective. So the very first thing I would say is that most patients with SIH will have an orthostatic headache. So the stories that I most commonly see with a CSF leak patient is they will tell me that they wake up in the morning and when their head is still on the pillow, they do not have a headache and it's the best that they feel all day. And then when they stand up and put their feet on the floor, their headache begins either immediately or a half hour later or a couple hours later and it gets progressively worse throughout the day and it's often accompanied by cranial nerve symptoms. The challenge is that the cranial nerve symptoms are different in many different patients. So we will hear from them that they have tinnitus or muffled hearing, uh, almost like water in their ears. Uh, and disequilibrium is a very common one, not so much vertigo, but they feel uh, like they, their balance is off. Um, and then a whole bunch of other symptoms. Then when they lay down, all of those symptoms get better. And so if you get that story, that very orthostatic story, that would be a scenario, even in, with brain MRI negative, that you may consider uh, sending the patient for additional workup. I hope that thank answers so that much. question. Yes, you answered this uh, thoroughly. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Nurulak Kusmene from Izmir. Thank you, Professor. It was a great lecture. Because of the ve uh, venous relationship of the leak, is it possible to treat by embolization of the venous part? Thank uh, you. This question is already. Uh, yes, answered by the latest. Uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think so, so. So that was part of the, the talk. And I'm guessing that this question came up right before it. So uh, kudos, yeah. kudos to, uh, to him for, for thinking of that. I mean, that's really pretty incredible, right? Uh, came up with this wonderful idea uh, right before me showing the slide. So, so yes, uh, you, we can treat these fistulas via, um, you know, catheter directed therapy on the venous side using onyx embolization. I know uh, one of the challenges with onyx embolization, at least from a radiology perspective, is it is very radio dense. And so what happens is I've had patients where I've sent them for embolization and you have this dense onyx cast that causes streak artifact, almost like orthopedic hardware, and you can't see anything anymore uh, on the CT myelogram. And it makes it exceedingly difficult when that procedure doesn't work to go find the leak again. Um, and so that is one thing to consider uh, as you do that. I do think you guys uh, in Europe and other places have other embolic materials that are less radio dense. I believe one of them is called squid. So if there's any neurointerventionalists out there, uh, you may try using that. I know there's interest here in the United States at getting FDA approval to be able to use that uh, for this purpose because it would be less dense. But uh, just a pitfall to consider uh, before you do the embolization. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question from Dr. Boktash Achilkus. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your excellent presentation. Do you have any experience for spontaneous disappearance of symptoms after contrast myelography? Interesting question. I'm not sure I fully understand it. I'm assuming uh, what's meant by this is maybe we do a diagnostic no, contrast. Stay in after that. Yeah. yeah, and then the patient feels better. I haven't seen that to be curative in any patient. I have had patients where they temporarily feel better, uh, and I think it's because you are increasing the volume. Mm -hmm. And so for a while, we at Duke were doing uh, what we called CSF volume provocation maneuvers. So for instance, uh, we know patients who have high pressure, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, when they come in with really, really bad headaches and they're in the emergency department with double vision, right, diplopia, and we do a lumbar puncture and their pressure is 42 and their headaches are 10, 10 out of 10, and we take a whole bunch of fluid off and normalize their pressure, their headache goes away. And so we postulated that people with low CSF volume in the setting of a leak may feel better if we replace their volume. And so we would inject Elliott's B, which is basically um, synthetic CSF or, or saline that's got ions, uh, the equivalent of CSF, uh, 
And we did that for quite a while. And we did find that patients would get better when doing that. It wasn't reliable enough that we use it as a uh, diagnostic tool that we uh, hang our hats on, so to speak. But, but yes, we do see that. We do see that patients feel better when we increase their volume status when they have a leak. Uh, I think Madonna, uh, Professor Bekta Sajikos wants to ask if the contrast medium act like a dural pitch. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <sighs> Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to host you. It was my pleasure to present you. Uh, thank you so much. I think all the, all my questions I had in my mind were answered uh, in the course of your presentation. It was like a uh, uh, breath of fresh air from the history to ongoing trends and future perspectives. So thank you very much again, Dr. Timothy. Uh, if anyone else has a, a question uh, in the chat or wants to speak up, uh, to uh, uh, your willing to all the questions and comments. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor Bekta Shachik Kurs, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no electricity in his uh, city, maybe. Yes, uh, I am in dark. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> the, the electricity is still, still gone? Yes, we are in dark. Excuse okay. me. Uh, why I uh, asked that question, we had a few patients uh, who disappeared to CSF leak after cisternography, contrast cisternography. We have very few cases, and I had one experience for uh, repairing in the thoracic area in a spontaneous uh, case, you know, yeah. That's very interesting. Um, I haven't had any experience where the, the contrast itself was curative. Um, however, uh, I do think it's the case where you can get spontaneous resolution of a CSF leak, right? Um, we do know that's part of the conservative treatment, right? For lumbar punctures, you just have the patient lay flat. And I think maybe that's what you were seeing. I, I'm not sure. It's hard to know, right? But uh, it's possible that the patient had spontaneous resolution. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. We are talking about the uh, contrast medium, as Professor Suju taught. We are mm -hmm. thinking the same way, yeah. Uh, after meningitis, for example, caused that leak spontaneously disappearing. Okay, I, I've not seen that, but that's interesting. Well, I'll definitely keep an eye out for it. Yeah, it's really thank interesting. Uh, I see. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Baktash. I think one question added up from the chat. There's a uh, comment from, from, from Rulak yes, I think for, we should uh, read it. Yes. Uh, uh, can a blood patch be unsuccessful? Oh, no, and what's that. the next step? Ah, before that. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. I, I, I have read it. I, I read it already. Um, it was can great, great, great. There, there, there is a comment from Nurullah uh, uh, Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. I read it as well about embolization. Okay. I read it. Okay. Uh, can a blood patch be unsuccessful? And what's the next step is uh, from uh, Ikaterini uh, Polisoy? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, blood patches uh, definitely can be unsuccessful. I don't think we know very well yet. Um, what subtypes of CSF leaks um, respond better to blood patches versus others. In fact, this is a bit of a hot topic. Um, and I think like anything else in medicine uh, comes with it, uh, lots of very strong opinions that sometimes differ from each other. Uh, and so uh, for instance, the CSF to venous fistula, some of my colleagues uh, say, well, why would a blood patch possibly work to disrupt a connection between uh, you know, CSF containing nerve root sleeve and an adjacent vein? Uh, and that logically seems to make sense to me. Uh, there was a publication that came out of UCSF in California where they had a 100% success rate after patching, uh, but that was a short series of patients with only short-term follow-up. And so we have uh, different answers depending on who you ask. Um, I, I, in my experience, in our group's experience at Duke where we do you know, 400 patches a year, the fistulas do respond to patching sometimes. Uh, but not always. And uh, similarly, those ventral disc osteophyte spurs and dural tears do respond to patches sometimes, but not always. And so I think it is a case by case basis. There are many cases where 
the patches do not work and they usually go on to surgery. Uh, and then now with fistulas in particular, we will sometimes send them for embolization. Surgical approaches are actually very, have very high cure rates, uh, but they are uh, obviously invasive, right? And so if we can keep them out of the OR, we, we attempt to do that. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I see no more questions. Uh, I know it's well past 11. Uh, in here is past 8 p.m. in Georgia. I think it's even later in Turkey. So, um, uh, Dr. Hassan, have you any comments or questions? Uh, I want to thank again to Professor Timothy Arhay. Uh, it was a great lecture. It was a great night for us. Thank you. I want to thank everyone who joined us today, this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. So much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time and, uh, and uh, everybody's attendance. Thank you.